Good evening. I'm David Gergen, and I'm delighted to welcome Neil Ferguson to this stage and to return, I think this is my fourth or fifth visit here to the 92nd Street Y. And your questions have always been uh, penetrating. We look forward to receiving them before the evening is out. Uh, we are discussing someone who has been rather controversial. Uh, as, as Neil has pointed out in his book, he has both been revered and reviled, uh, but Kissinger has never been unimportant. Uh, so, Neil, thank you for coming. We're delighted to see you. I'm sorry to report to you that we're, uh, Neil is, has announced, it's been announced by the Stanford University that they have captured Neil, uh, who's going to be moving out there, and I, uh, it's going to be Harvard's loss, um, but we'll try to make up for it in other ways. And now, Neil, I, this is uh, 847 pages for volume one. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had the experience on book tours of running into a, an interviewer and wondering whether he has read your book. And then you run into another interviewer and you wonder if he's ever read any book. <laughs> <laughs> I have had the privilege of reading some of your other books, but I have not, I want to confess up front, I did an interview yesterday, a conversation with Ben Bernanke, who had a 500-page book, and then you come along with 847 pages. It's more than I can do. Uh, I can, you guys can, can write faster than I can read. Um, but I, I, let's, let's start by, uh, this is just, this is volume one. Um, Don't worry, it's a massive, one more. It's a massive undertaking. And I'm curious, how you've put in 10 years, that you said in here, you spent 10 years on this off and on. So it's, extra, extra, why did you write? Why did you decide to take on this uh, assignment for yourself? Well, it's probably telling, worth telling that story. Uh, I, I do so in the preface, in the spirit of full disclosure. It was 2003, actually, when I first met Henry Kissinger. And we met not, not in New York, as you might expect, but in London. And uh, he did something that, that immediately flattered me. Th this is how you get on the right side of a professor <coughs> if you meet a professor at a cocktail party. You say you've read one of his books. <laughs> and he had read The Pity of War. Uh, we talked about the First World War uh, for a few minutes. We were getting on famously when he suddenly disappeared and, uh, and then reappeared on the other side of the room next to the supermodel Elle McPherson, <laughs> who had just walked in. And, uh, I, the I, secret I, swinger. I was impressed by the speed at which he, he m made that move. <laughs> So I thought I can learn from this man. <laughs> to be serious, uh, this began a, a correspondence, really, about the, the idea of, uh, of somebody writing a scholarly biography. I wasn't the first person that he discussed this with. Uh, but at first, I was hesitant, because it seemed like an absolutely daunting task in two respects. There would be a mountain of material. And then, remember, this is 2003. And then Christopher Hitchens would review the book. And I, <laughs> I don't know which I was more daunted by, the mountain of material or the Hitchens review. So I said no, and I got an introduction to Kissingerian diplomacy because he wrote back saying, Dear Neil, I'm very sorry to hear that. Just when I had made up my mind that you were the right man to do it. And, and just uh, when I found 145 boxes of my private papers and letters that I thought had been lost. Now, I don't know if any of you fish, but um, at this point, I, I was the trout and that was the fly. And <laughs> I swam up to the surface and bit because I was curious and I went to look at the papers. And I have to tell you that the papers were some of the most electrifying documents I've ever seen in my career. Mm -hmm. It felt a little bit like it did when I was invited to write a history of the Rothschild Bank uh, many years ago. That first moment of opening the files and finding the raw material and thinking, I've got to do this. And that's how I felt when I looked through some of these early private papers. Were, were the boxes mostly about his earlier life with, uh, uh, for volume one, or did they cover his entire life? They, they in fact, included stuff that extended into uh, the recent past. In mm. fact, I remember looking at a, an extraordinary document uh, from 1989 describing a meeting with Deng Xiaoping. But the things that grabbed me and persuaded me that I should write the book were, were the earlier documents. Uh, for example, letters to his parents from the late 1940s, uh, just after his return from World War II, 
an amazing essay uh, that he wrote, having witnessed the liberation of a concentration camp, uh, a diary of his first trip to Vietnam in 1965. And you realize there you had things that these went, his, his, his public life has been well plowed over, but you were finding things about who he was right. that could help in, inform you about his later Yes, and I, I began to think as I was reading the material, gosh, this is not at all the Henry Kissinger I've been led to expect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that became obvious quite early on. I had, I had tentatively thought, once I had agreed to do it, uh, that I would subtitle the first volume, American Machiavelli. That was the kind of working title I had in mind. But, but that's, that's what he was perceived to be. That's exactly how I'd been uh, led to, to think of him by a generation of, of writers, uh, including Hitchens, but uh, Seymour Hirsch as well, who'd represented Kissinger as the most uh, ruthless, devious, amoral practitioner of, of realpolitik. Uh, and that's, that's putting it politely. Uh, so my expectation was, um, was of, of somebody who was uh, in that mold. Imagine my surprise to find as I read through even his early published work that that had been completely misunderstood and that in fact his writings on, on Metternich and later on Bismarck are, are critiques of realpolitik. So for me the excitement was partly that the material was, was extraordinary and it was fresh and no one had looked at it, but also it contradicted the received wisdom about Kissinger's character. This book, I know it looks dauntingly long, and I, I apologize that it coincides it's, with Ben Bernanke's it's, nearly as long book. No, no, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's a much my fault. It's a much faster read. <laughs> uh, I think it is more fun, with yeah. all due respect to the Fed, former Fed chairman. <laughs> but this covers the first half of his life. It's always exactly chronological. And, and what I wanted to try and show in writing this volume was that uh, Kissinger was not just national security advisor and secretary of state. Uh, the first half of his life, uh, right down to the end of 1968, saw him as a refugee from Hitler's Germany, as a GI, as a counterintelligence agent in occupied Germany, then as a student, uh, a graduate student. He went through the whole Harvard life cycle, ultimately becoming a professor. As somebody who became involved in, in American politics, quite early on in the late 1950s. There's a whole series of lives of Henry Kissinger that simply haven't been discussed. Walter Isaacson, whose, whose biography is the best up until now, gives much less space. Well, I think he would acknowledge that this is a far more this, thoroughly researched this book. This is a far deeper is. book. Because what Walter didn't have access to these papers and he had to base most of what he wrote on interviews. Believe me, interviews are a much less reliable source, especially if they take place 20, 30, or 40 years after the events. So even Walter had, had only been able to give a few chapters to, in effect, the first half of the life. And, and I thought this, therefore, was a, an important project because I was going to try to change the way in which this man was understood. <clears throat> it reminds me so much of um, uh, Eisenhower, who was seen as sort of a dolt, not very bright, and then uh, a, a Democrat who had voted against him twice, voted for Stevenson twice, Fred Greenstein from Princeton, had access, had, was the first one to have access to his papers, and he was shocked by what he found, because it was so contrary to the public persona, and he wrote a book called The Hidden Hand Presidency. It was really, he was, he was managing things in ways that nobody understood. And Marty Anderson had this experience when yeah, he started to look at Reagan's yep. papers. I mean, in American politics, perhaps more than in the politics of any other state, appearances deceive. This is partly because of the, the way the American media creates or recreates a personality. You, you know, your first impression of, of Kissinger, if you were around in the early 1970s, was of Super K, this hero who was on the cover of Time or Newsweek every other week, uh, solving the world's great diplomatic crises. Uh, it was only later that the press then decided, having built him up, to knock him down. Uh, and so one got these two caricatures, first Super K and then Dr. Evil. Uh, so in order to write the history of, of uh, modern America, one has to be ready really to jettison the expected character. So uh, let's talk about what the meaning, as you see, of, of, of the idealist and what this, uh, this tension is between the realist, the Machiavel, versus what is popularly thought of as an idealist would be Woodrow Wilson, mm. sort of woolly-headed, 
you know, believed that we could all put down our arms and we could have pacifism around the world, kumbaya, and all the rest. But that's not what you're really talking about as idealism. You have a, yeah. a, a more muscular view of that. There is a streak of Wilsonian uh, idealism in the young Kissinger, but, but, but it's a streak. It's not the dominant uh, uh, facet. Clearly, it's not kumbaya. I mean, it's not as if Henry Kissinger ever had a guitar and ever sang John Lennon's Imagine. Uh, <laughs> I think we can rule that out. Uh, so we're, we're really talking about idealism uh, as opposed to realism in, in terms of schools of American foreign policy. Uh, and conventionally, people say, well, realism is about a narrow definition of national interest, uh, which is prepared to do whatever it takes to pursue that national interest, including uh, nasty uh, and, and not pleasant things, uh, and is not actuated by any uh, great principles of the sort that Wilson enunciated around the time of the First World War, like international law, self-determination for peoples, and so forth. Well, are the neocons as close to the realist school as we have in our... Who would, who would no, you now point to today? Uh, yeah, oddly enough, I think Nixon was a realist. And one of the things, in fact, this afternoon I was discussing with my students at Harvard was Nixon's uh, ad address to Congress in 1970 when he tries to explain what his strategy is going to be. And there he says, look, this isn't about ideology. This is all about national interest. That was very definitely Nixon talking. Uh, and that is how Nixon thought. Kissinger turns out to be quite different. And it's important to understand in this story that up until December 1968, when Richard Nixon offered him the job of national security advisor, Kissinger was a really harsh critic of Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Because in Kissinger's political life, it was Nelson Rockefeller, not Richard Nixon, uh, whom he followed. So what, what idealism am I talking about here? L let me give you three uh, ways in which Henry Kissinger should be thought of as an idealist. Now, I, I know it probably sounds really contrarian to you, and you, you might well think he called it that. He subtitled the book The Idealist just to upset readers of the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's not the case, um, al although it might seem that way. The reason I, I call him an idealist is that the young Henry Kissinger, by the way, volume two will have a different subtitle, though I don't know what that is yet. But it won't be the realist. It will not be the realist because that's too bloody obvious. He's an idealist partly because he grows up under the shadow of World War II. He lives and suffers as a result of World War II. And World War II he sees as the consequence of a failed realist foreign policy called appeasement. There's a very interesting interview in the late 1950s in one of the New York newspapers when Kissinger says, the, the men of the 1930s, meaning Neville Chamberlain, thought of themselves as tough realists. Now, anybody who has witnessed the rise of Hitler, the outbreak of World War II, who's then had to go and fight uh, in Europe and then in Germany against uh, the Nazis' forces, is hardly well disposed towards appeasement. So, number one, I think he saw appeasement as failed realism. And I think that's actually a valid perspective. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, when he finally got to Harvard after his war service, he came under the influence of William Yandel Elliott, who was a professor in the government department, so a slightly overbearing southerner, rather bombastic, uh, who had studied at Oxford and become influenced by idealist philosophy. Now, it was Elliott who got Kissinger started on Kant, and Immanuel Kant plays something of an important role here. Because you have to imagine the scenario. You, you may have done this yourself in your Harvard career, David. Imagine a student comes into your office. You're very busy. You've got to go to CNN in 10 minutes. Uh, or a president has a call uh, scheduled with you. And in comes this rather plump, unprepossessing undergraduate with a thick accent and says, I am your tutee. I have been assigned to you. The obvious response is, come back when you've read the complete works of Immanuel Kant. <laughs> I think William Yandel Elliott said that, expecting never to see Henry Kissinger again. He underestimated the young man, who returned duly, having read the works of Kant, and proceeded to write this massive senior thesis, the longest in Harvard's history. 
<laughs> so long that there's a rule now called the Kissinger Rule to stop you writing such a long thesis. And the title of the thesis is wonderful because it's, it's rather modest and, and, and academic. The meaning of history. <laughs> and the meaning of history, when you plough through it, it's pretty turgid. Uh, it turns out to be a, a, a long and sustained essay on, on Kant's philosophy of history and theory of freedom, idea of freedom. And, and Kissinger says very explicitly, the idea of freedom, the sense that we are free when we choose, that the experience of making a choice is the more powerful thing. Even if there is an arc of history leading ultimately to perpetual peace, which Kant said in a famous essay, that doesn't really dominate the sense of human freedom. This idea of freedom is, is very important to the young Kissinger, so much so that he defines himself against those who would see the Cold War, which was of course then beginning, as a struggle between two economic systems. And this is the third way in which he's an idealist. Most people in the late 40s, early 1950s at Harvard are rushing around getting excited about social science of one sort or another especially economics, which was about to take off and become one of the dominant disciplines of our era. Kissinger rejected the economically driven view of the world hmm. uh, and saw himself in antagonism to materialist theories of all sorts, Marxism, Leninism, but also capitalist theories the of economic determinism. And that's, determinism. that's important. He was, yeah. he, was, he was taking on the determinism. Absolutely. And he says in an extremely important passage in the senior thesis, we should reject totalitarianism, even if it proves to be the more efficient economic system, because its suppression of freedom is the thing that we should reject unconditionally. So I think when you start to read through Kissinger's published and unpublished work, a completely different picture emerges. And just to finish a rather long-winded answer, when you look at what he wrote about the great realists of the 19th century, which is what he worked on as a graduate student and a junior professor, He's criticizing them for their realism. Metternich is represented in a pretty critical, pretty critical light in the doctoral dissertation that gets published as a world restored. And then Bismarck, he clearly condemns as somebody who had no moral scruples and therefore no moral underpinning for what he did. So I think in those senses, this book is rightly called The Idealist. It leaves me with a challenge, what will the next volume be called? But I, I think at least I've shown that the young Kissinger was was an idealist, not a realist. I, I, yeah, that's interesting you know, about Metternich and, and Bismarck. Did, did he, he's often, a, Kissinger's often associated with balance of power and teaching that and, and, and part of being a theorist of balance of power, which I thought was a, a, came out of the realist school. Right. So two very interesting points. When he writes about equilibrium, order, balance, in that first book, A World Restored, which is a terrifically good book, it must be said. It, it, it's actually a doctoral dissertation. It's very show-offy. It's a young man's book, uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's riveting. Uh, and what's riveting about it is that he tells the story, really, of Napoleon's downfall and then the creation of a post-Napoleonic order in Europe, mostly in terms of the actions of the key uh, negotiators of the time, Metternich, uh, Castlereagh, the British Foreign Secretary, who's really the hero, Talleyrand, etc. What he argues in the more abstract parts of the book is that balance, order in the international system, is not just some kind of physics. It is something that requires two things to come about. A, a balancing power. There has to be some power that is making the balance happen. Britain, in the period he was writing about, the United States, it would have to be in the, in the modern period. And secondly, you cannot have an international order unless it has legitimacy. The balance has to have legitimacy in the eyes of those within it. And that can be undone if there's a revolutionary power. So Kissinger's theory of the balance of power is pretty sophisticated, and it certainly amounts to much more than is conventionally put into textbooks when they summarize balance of power theories. Last interesting reflection on this. He's a Wilsonian when it comes to the issue of national self-determination. Mm -hmm. There are a whole series of crises in the early Cold War that boil down to the issue of whether countries can opt to be independent or whether they're going to be brought under communist rule. 
And on each occasion when this issue comes up, Kissinger sides with self-determination. For example, Kennedy ultimately solves the Berlin crisis by acquiescing in the construction of the Berlin Wall with the famous line, a wall is better than a war. Well, Kissinger's very against that deal. Uh, he sees that as a grubby compromise uh, that sacrifices the will of the German people uh, to realpolitik. So he's a, he's a critic of Kennedy for Kennedy's realism. Uh, and then when the issue of a little country called South Vietnam first comes up, Kissinger's response is a fairly standard idealist position. Oh, well, they, they are entitled to self-determination, and if they want to be an independent state, we, the United States, should be willing to support them in that. This is the ver very early 60s, even late 50s, when the issue first surfaces. So I think this young Kissinger has even got some Wilsonian elements in his thinking. It's, I mean, it sounds odd. You think of John F. Kennedy as the great realist and, and the great idealist, yeah. and, and Kissinger as the sort of arch-realist. But in fact, at the time, it looked the other way around. To Kissinger, who worked in the Kennedy administration, had his first government experience there, Kennedy was doing these deals over the Cuban missiles as well as over Berlin that compromised the principles of the United States. So was Kissinger against the assassination of Diem? Yes, he was. This uh, in the Kennedy years. He was a South Vietnamese leader the, the, that, that the, Kennedy basically acquiesced in Kelly. Yes, I mean, Kennedy uh, rather casually, uh, he claimed inadvertently, approved a coup mm -hmm. that led to the not only the overthrow but the murder uh, of the South Vietnamese uh, leader, Diem. This was a terrifically important moment in the escalation of American involvement in Vietnam because really after that, the, the US had broken it and owned it, the, the mm -hmm. Saigon government. Well, Kissinger was really <coughs> outraged by this. Uh, he ri writes furiously about the moral turpitude of this act and he tries to persuade Nelson Rockefeller to say this in public. Uh, and it's the beginning of a long and unsuccessful battle on Kissinger's part to shift Rockefeller to a more critical stance uh, on Vietnam. Uh, and this is already in 1963. So one of the things I show in this book that is very much not what you expect is that Kissinger very quickly became a skeptic about, about Vietnam. And by the time he went there in 1965, uh, was very swiftly disillusioned about what was being done. I think this is one of the most exciting parts of the book, actually, because Kissinger's diary of his first trip to Vietnam and the subsequent two trips is riveting. Uh, it's riveting because you see him switch from being the professor back to being the counterintelligence agent who had been so successful in Nazi hunting in post-war Germany. Uh, you see him switch back to being a soldier. Instead of sitting in Saigon in the compound with the other terrified uh, so-called experts from the US, he goes out into the countryside. He hurtles around in uh, heavily armed helicopters trying to actually see what the situation is on the ground. He goes out to outposts held by special forces and CIA. And he very quickly realizes that the whole thing is metaphorically and possibly literally going to pot because there is a very, very dysfunctional uh, relationship between all the different agencies that are supposedly waging this war, uh, from the army itself right across to, to the CIA and then the various aid agencies involved. Moreover, he realizes that the Saigon government is chronically corrupt and probably can never really be propped up by any amount of support. So he, he writes this devastating report, 1965, remember, saying this is hopeless, and we are only going to get out of this by diplomatic means. So, I know this jumps forward into your next book, because this ends just before he starts working with Richard Nixon, but there is, has always been a sense, the conventional wisdom is that the Nixon-Kissinger relationship was a marriage of two, of two realists. So now you're arguing, Kissinger came in as an idealist. Is there a part of Richard Nixon that was also an idealist? If you read his Quaker, you know, writings, if you read some of the things in his private diary, they're quite, they have a very strong moral message. It was the way he pursued things, the means he used, they became the Machiavellian and ultimately illegal. Yes. 
I think the, the, the relationship is going to be a huge part of the first part of volume two. What one sees in this volume is that there's almost no relationship at all. Mm -hmm. uh, because Kissinger, who couldn't help but be affected by Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he spent so much of his adult life, regarded Richard Nixon with deep suspicion. So much so that he, he avoided Nixon when Nixon approached him seeking his advice in 1960. This is quite a funny story because I thought, the way historians do, I'm going to find the true origin of the Nixon-Kissinger relationship. And I thought I'd found it because it turned out that this man, Elliot, the Southern professor who was Kissinger's Harvard mentor, had also been an advisor to Nixon. That William Yandel Elliot had parleyed his way into Nixon's uh, favor quite early on uh, when they were both involved in something called the Herter Commission. I mean, this is way back when Nixon is a, a freshly minted congressman. I thought, boom, this is going to be it. Elliot's going to introduce Nixon to Kissinger. I'm going to find the prehistory of the relationship. Nothing came of it. First of all, Elliot, seeing that Kissinger was rather too talented and might indeed eclipse him, <laughs> warned Nixon not to consult, uh, of all the Harvard academics, he might consult Henry Kissinger. So Elliot knifes his, his own protege. Um, Nixon disregards this and writes to Kissinger who had already made some impact on the, as a public intellectual, seeking his advice. Kissinger is so desperate to avoid having anything to do with Nixon that he invents a trip to Japan to avoid meeting Nixon. Now, if you want to avoid somebody, <laughs> you really want to avoid them very badly if you go all the way to Japan to achieve He actually that. went there? Yeah. So this Japan trip, which I, I mean, in the correspondence kind of comes out of nowhere and doesn't seem awfully important, but it's a perfect pretext for not taking the meeting. So I think um, what I showed was that there was a non-relationship between them. Uh, and that makes it all the more puzzling that Nixon chose Kissinger to be his national security advisor. In fact, this is one of the whodunits, one of the puzzles that makes this book quite fun to read because it doesn't make any sense. Kissinger kept bad-mouthing Nixon he was loyal to Rockefeller through three failed bids. Uh, but for I, the bet Republican Nixon nomination. Read, I bet Nixon had actually read some of his books. That's the key, David. You absolutely nailed it. Although they never met until the end of 1967, it's clear that Nixon read Kissinger. He certainly read Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, the right. book that made Kissinger's reputation. He probably had read a good deal of the the foreign affairs articles that, that Kissinger regularly wrote. And because Nixon was a rather misanthropic man who wasn't at all gregarious, this was actually how he liked to get to know somebody. Absolutely. By reading their stuff. Absolutely. The opposite of Nelson Rockefeller, who couldn't read because he was dyslexic, and, right. and, and liked to get to know about a book by hiring the person who wrote yeah. it. Yeah, Nixon and, and Kissinger, I, I was there for some of those conversations. They loved to uh, compare the generals of World War I. Absolutely. They both had a very deep interest in World War I. And, and you know when he brought when Nixon brought uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in yeah. as his first counselor with Arthur Burns, they were both there. Um, and it was Moynihan he turned to for reading recommendations. And Moynihan had him read a book about Disraeli, for example, by Robert Blake. And they had long conversations about that. Nixon used to wake up at two or three o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep, and would read. And uh, he loved reading history. And I think that's how he got. I, it was very attracted into Kissinger. It's very interesting you say this, and I'll definitely have to interview you for volume <laughs> two. No, I. But it's I, a I lovely never, image, isn't it? Richard Nixon reading Blake's Disraeli. Blake's Disraeli, one of the great political biographies ever written, which I remember reading as an undergraduate and being inspired by. And, and Nixon's such an un-Disraelian figure. Right. And yet I think, I think this is probably the way to think about the relationship. I mean, there are all sorts of complexities involved in this story. There is the legend of 1968, uh, the legend that Kissinger leaked secrets about the Vietnam talks to the Nixon campaign and was rewarded for this nefarious deed with the job of national security advisor. I think that is a myth, and I think I've pretty much demolished it. Uh, but the story is nevertheless a fascinating one uh, because you have to work out why having been publicly attacked by Kissinger, Nixon would offer him a job. Guido Goldman, uh, who was in those days Kissinger's doctoral student, has a funny answer to the question, why did Nixon choose Kissinger? And it goes like this. Henry Kissinger was the only thing of Nelson Rockefeller's that Richard Nixon could afford. <laughs> 
<laughs> the audience is now being taken back to a, a vanished age. I mean, it's almost unimaginable, isn't it, that a dyslexic, womanizing, multi-millionaire could dream of having the Republican Party nomination in a presidential election. Nothing like that could possibly happen today, <laughs> could it? No, no, no. no. Uh, but it is. Uh, but, but but presidents are drawn to that. You know. You know. And, uh, Lyndon Johnson brought Doris Kearns Goodwin into the White House and then adopted her as a project because she had written a piece before she was a White House fellow um, attacking him on Vietnam, and he wanted to convince her that he was right and what he had done. And they. And that's how they developed this relationship. She wrote a book on it. You know. Was one of her best books. Jo Johnson makes some um, interesting appearances in this volume, not least in 1967 when he uh, encounters Kissinger as a result of a, an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to initiate talks with the North Vietnamese. This is a, an interesting and rather colourful story. It's the sort of international man of mystery part of Kissinger's career beginning. Uh, Kissinger threw something called Pugwash, which some of you will have heard of. Uh, Pugwash was a, a conference, an annual conference, that brought people, academics, together from both sides of the Iron Curtain. It was one of the few ways, actually, that you could communicate uh, across the Iron Curtain throughout the Cold War. Kissinger used to go to these conferences and met, through Pugwash, some people who had some contacts uh, to North Vietnam. Uh, and in fact, two Frenchmen uh, went to North Vietnam with Kissinger's encouragement to try to persuade Hanoi to start meaningful talks with the United States. And Johnson uh, made multiple attempts, as you all doubtless know, to, to get talks going as he became more and more uneasy about the progress of the war. And this was the one that actually came the closest uh, to succeeding before 1968 when the talks finally happened. So there was this extraordinary sequence of events in which Kissinger spent a great deal of the year in Paris, desperately trying to get a meeting, or even just a call, with the North Vietnamese representative. Uh, it, it's a little bit waiting for Godot, because there are endless plans about meetings that never happen. And this is the education of Kissinger the diplomat, because of course the North Vietnamese had no intention whatsoever of starting talks with the United States at that point. They were planning the Tet Offensive. You had a rather amusing story in the book about uh, Kissinger spending a lot of time in Paris with negotiations and what the true story was behind that. So this is uh, when the historian learns humility if he hasn't already learned it. You can read, as I have, thousands, tens of thousands of pages and, and you can get material from, well, for this book, 50 archives, for the whole project, about 111. And you can really immerse yourself in the documents. And then you can interview people, just for good measure. But you never can get to the whole truth. You can't reenact the past exactly. You're getting to a kind of approximation of the truth. So I had this wonderful chapter written. In fact, I had a whole book finished explaining how, among other things, Henry Kissinger had tried and failed to start peace talks in 1967. And why was he incessantly in Paris well, doing it? That was, that was what I had completely missed until his wife, Nancy Kissinger, broke it to me. And she sort of made me sit down because she knew it was going to be a blow and asked the question, Neil, why do you think Henry was spending so much time in Paris in 1967? And I thought for a horrible moment, oh no, what have I missed? And she said, because I was in Paris in 1967, and she had been in Paris working on her doctoral dissertation in the French archives at the Sorbonne uh, University, and Kissinger was quite happy to waste the summer <laughs> in futile <laughs> diplomatic negotiations that went nowhere because he was seeing the woman who would become his second wife. <laughs> there is no record of that relationship anywhere that I have been able to find until the early 1970s, when the gossip columns start to notice that Dr. Kissinger is seeing rather a lot of Nancy McGuinness. They had, in fact, met in 1964 at the crazy Republican convention in San Francisco. They it's kept boring. their relationship pretty successfully secret for the better part of a decade, including from me, his authorized biographer. So this tells you something important about what historians can do. They can get you close 
they can get you close to what really happened. And I said when I was setting out to write this book, I, I'm not writing a hagiography here. If you give me access to your private papers, I will write as far as I can find out what actually happened, and you will not like it all. But what actually happened, this is a Rankian phrase, wie es eigentlich gewesen, is ultimately unattainable. You can't get there because some of it is inevitably lost or concealed. That brings up the point about what your relationship with Henry Kissinger has been in, in creating this book. You, you actually had an agreement with him about, and this is, this is the authorized biography, but walk us through that. Well, authorized is a very uh, un, uh, uneasy making word, isn't it? Because it slightly implies yeah. that the subject has control over the, uh, the author. So in order to avoid that, I said from the outset, exactly as I had said to the Rothschild family years before, I'll do this, uh, but you have to accept that you won't have any say over what I write, none. And I will do my best to find out what really happened, but I won't just confine myself to your papers and you, I'll confine myself to whatever I can get my hands on and whoever I can talk to. So we had an agreement which makes it absolutely clear that uh, though I have access to his private papers and to interviews with him, it's my book and I write what I find. Th this has led to strains inevitably in the relationship because not everything in this book makes Henry Kissinger look good. When did you first share with him a manuscript? Uh, as I was writing, we had we'd said that he wouldn't look at it and for a long time he said, I don't want to look at it. In fact, I think I'm not giving too much away when I say that on one occasion he said, I don't expect to live to see this. But at 92, he's very much alive and, and firing on all cylinders. And so as I was writing, and I only really got going last year and was writing very fast in the first half of this year, I thought, why not just let him read these draft chapters? Because there may be things that he will be prompted to remember by seeing quotations from things that he wrote 50, 60, 70 years ago. And this was a good idea because it did actually, A, jog memories, and, and B, there were things that I, I had got wrong. To give you a, an example, there's an amazing letter in which he describes the Battle of the Bulge at which he was present. Being in a village extremely close to the German uh, front line, being shelled, uh, and, and really within a mile of being captured by the Germans. Pretty hair-raising experience. He wrote a letter to his brother, and I quote, quoted this as a letter uh, to his brother. Um, when he saw the, the chapter, he called me up. I think I was walking down the street, and I got this animated call saying, no, 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 you, you've got to realize that this is a co-authored letter, which we thought we would be able to get published and it combines my experiences with Fritz Kramer's. Kramer is an amazing character in this story, a sort of Mephistopheles figure, who was really the guy who discovered Kissinger's uh, intellectual capacity. They were both private soldiers in the US Army. They were both refugees from Hitler's Germany. Kramer was a bit older and already had a doctorate. Kramer was the intellectual. Kramer was the guy that the army got to lecture the uh, soldiers about what Germany would be like when they got there. Um, and so Kramer and he became very close, and it was Kramer who said, you're a young man, you must make more of yourself than City College of New York. Uh, you must aspire to study history and philosophy. It's interesting how in this life, as I tell it, there's a series of mentors who see potential in Kissinger and encourage him to go in directions that he might not otherwise have taken. So the letter turned out to be jointly written by Kissinger and Kramer with a view to publication. It was true, it was just the experiences that they both had in the same place at the same time. I would never have been able to work that out. So I've never written a book about, about somebody alive. Um, everything I've done in the past uh, of this sort, whether it was the 19th century Rothschilds or Sigmund Warburg, uh, has been written long after the the, the subject had gone. So it's a very interesting experience to use the, the research that you've taken to jog somebody's memory. And, and it, it produced some really surprising results. Hey, uh, knowing Henry, and I, I'm a big fan of Henry's, um, it, it, it's, 
impossible to believe that if he read a chapter and, and not was not factually wrong, but he just disagreed with the interpretation, that he wouldn't come back to you and say something. Absolutely, and we had some very heated discussions <laughs> about this. And this is where the author that's, is That's why it gets very complicated. Yeah, well, it, not really. I mean, you kind of, in a discussion like that, you know when you're going from a factual issue to an interpretation issue. It's pretty clear. Right. And so we had some... You know, we had some disagreements about whether or not he'd really been chasing girls in foot in the early 1930s, uh, alleged by a contemporary of his in an interview many years later. And I, you know, I came to the conclusion that it probably was not true that he'd been chasing girls in foot in the early 19 or mid 1930s. But when you start arguing about, as I guess we uh, we argued about the the Vietnam negotiations '67. Uh, and how far that was a total blind alley. Or, for example, when we discussed the uh, origins of the, the opening to China, which is a huge, big deal in the um, second volume, obviously, I show in this volume that, that actually the idea of a US opening to China didn't come from Kissinger or Nixon, but from a Czech whom they got to know through this pugwash connection, a man named Snyderick, whom nobody's heard of. Uh, and there's an amazing account of a meeting in Prague between Kissinger and this Czech and when was that meeting? It was in 67. It's, because and Nixon, they continued Nixon, to talk into 68. Yeah, his, he had an article in Foreign Affairs in January of 68. Subsequent that. To was that. seen as the sort of, right. that, that was when he sort of laid out his plan to split the two apart if he could. And, and it's fascinating because that, that article that Richard Nixon wrote is often cited as the origin of the, uh, of the opening to China right, that exactly, happened in 1972. Exactly. No, I think he and Kissinger both got the idea from this character Snyderick. Now, Kissinger had completely forgotten that meeting, but oh. he kept extremely detailed records of it, um, and indeed had sent them to the State Department as a good American professor should after meeting with somebody from the communist bloc. Uh, and he was truly startled to be reminded of that. And, uh, and said uh, in amazement, I, I, I just, I can't believe he said all that. It was so prescient. Uh, so he'd somewhat forgotten the origin of what became probably the most strate important strategic move of American foreign policy in the Cold War. And I, I, I'm happy that I was able to exhume Snyderick from the obscurity of posterity. The, the, the things he says to, to Kissinger in these meetings in Prague are just astonishing. Uh, they're so prescient. He says, you've got to understand Mao hates the Soviets. He, he, he even hates the Soviet elements within China, the bureaucratic elements. Remember, this is the time of the Cultural Revolution. Mao is really a nationalist. Uh, and Mao's nationalism will lead him to do, uh, make a deal with you against the Soviets. Uh, and Snyderick says, it will be as shocking as the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, as the Nazi-Soviet <laughs> Pact of 1939. And Kissinger's first reaction was, you're crazy. We're never going to be able to deal with these these wild Chinese communists. But just a few years later, oh, 1971, yeah. he's flying to secretly to Beijing to have those talks with Zhou Enlai that, that really did change the world. Yeah. They, they both, both Kissinger and to a lesser extent Nixon, but Nixon was also deeply intellectual in his own way, certainly a good strategist. It, it's interesting how deeply engaged they, Kissinger was with the Academy and Nixon to a lesser extent, but then how much they soured on it mm. uh, as a result of the war. And they had, they both came out as very, I, I, I wonder if you talk to just for a moment the, the Harvard relationship, yeah. because it, it was so meaningful to Kissinger's undergraduate and then yet he became so alienated. Right. Well, here we sit as two Harvard professors talking about probably the most uh, famous Harvard professor of the lot, uh, certainly in the last half century, and a man whose uh, achievement, he goes from being a refugee in 1938 to being Secretary of State via Harvard, uh, ought to be celebrated, one would have thought, all around the university. And yet, because of the rift that opened up between him and his former colleagues, uh, very soon after he joined the Nixon administration, uh, Kissinger ended up wholly estranged from his alma mater, not going there for many, many years. He refused to set foot on the campus. He did not set foot on the campus until many, many years later, uh, and ha has more recently uh, softened and has been, I hope, 
in some measure reconciled I to the institution. Uh, but the origin of this rift is fascinating. And I think it gets us a little closer to understanding the lightning rod problem. What, why was it that Henry Kissinger, of all secretaries of state, came to be the most reviled? Why would his time in office arouse such incredibly vitriolic denunciation, despite the fact that when you look at the acts of other secretaries of state before and since, uh, there have been all sorts of things done uh, that aren't radically different in kind in the realm of foreign policy than were done in the Nixon and Ford administrations. Why is, uh, for example, just to take one example, why is there such fury about the US uh, involvement in Chile and more or less indifference today as the US gives aid to General Sisi's regime in Egypt, which is just sentenced to death a previously democratically elected president of Egypt. Why the lightning rod effect? I think the answer is that the Nixon administration became an opportunity in many ways for a generation of academics uh, to distance themselves from the catastrophe of Vietnam that many of them had had a hand in. There's a moment early in Kissinger's time in the Nixon administration when a whole bunch of his colleagues led by Tom Schelling come to Washington and publicly denounce him over the issue of Cambodia. Uh, and they, they, they come and Kissinger's expecting them to come for lunch and he's startled to find that they won't so much as shake his hand um, and they've got the press with them to hear the denunciation. When you look at the account of that moment, which was the beginning of the great rift between Kissinger and Harvard, and look at the people who were there doing the denouncing, it's interesting how many of them had actually served the Johnson administration and at quite high levels. And I thought to myself, there's more going on here than just moral outrage at the uh, uh, invasion of Cambodia. What is going on here is that a generation of Harvard academics who had been much involved in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations are doing their level best to put some distance between themselves and Vietnam at a time when the campus was exploding. And Kissinger leaves Harvard as the student unrest is really getting. You, there were, you think they were pandering to the students? I think, oh, I think they absolutely were. I mean, it was very clear Ernest May, uh, for whom I had great regard, came to that denunciation of Kissinger meeting, hot foot from a faculty meeting uh, discussing the student unrest. So I think there's some element of a connection there between what was happening on campus and what those academics did, who very quickly, uh, who very quickly denounced a man who'd been their colleague and in some cases their friend uh, just a few years before. We have a number of interesting questions from the floor, but I want to ask you one more about where, I know you still are doing research for your second volume, and you haven't re reached firm conclusions uh, yet. But what, uh, where, where you stand now, where does next, where will Kissinger go down in history? Is, will he be a, another Metric, another uh, Talleyrand? Who, who, should we look more toward Castlereagh? Who should we, what, 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 what other figures would you compare him to? Kissinger says early on in his, career that, that the statesman, a term that he uses to distinguish those making foreign policy uh, from charismatic leaders or warlords, the diplomats, are tragic figures. The statesman, he says, is a tragic figure because he's trying to avoid calamities. He's constantly worried about the nightmare scenario. But if he's successful in avoiding the nightmare scenario, he gets no thanks because people aren't grateful for disasters that are avoided. And this is what Kissinger calls the problem of conjecture. Hmm. Uh, it applies pretty nicely actually in the Cold War because nobody, nobody goes around being thankful that, that uh, Richard Nixon avoided World War III. Uh, and indeed the notion that that was a, an achievement is scoffed at. And yet from the vantage point of Kissinger's tragic statesman, that is the predicament. The actions you take preemptively to avoid catastrophe, the costs that you incur in taking those actions will not earn you much thanks. Uh, whereas those who kick the can down the road, as we would say today, are sometimes lucky and get away with it. So without thanking or reviling, 
where does he, what? So I think the, the answer to your question is, I think that there is something of the tragedy about Kissinger's career yeah. in the sense that he clearly uh, brought to a high office exceptional intellectual capability, mm. a very, very rare understanding of history, very rare, unfortunately, uh, in the commanding heights of government. Uh, he was also, it turned out, uh, a very accomplished tactician, a crisis manager with uh, exceptional gifts. A but, couple of, go ahead. But, but his reputation has been perhaps uh, irreparably damaged and certainly very badly scarred by that huge backlash that occurred beginning in the early 70s and continuing right through to the time of Christopher Hitchens against all that the Nixon administration did. And I'm not, I'm not sure that there's anything that one can do about that. I mean, that is, it seems to me, uh, beyond the power of any biographer to change. There is a fundamental tragedy there. It's tragic, too, that uh, having achieved as much uh, as he uh, achieved, having reached the, the position of Secretary of State, he vanished from government for the rest of his life after he, he stepped down in 1977. And in that sense, there's an, an unfinished quality to the project that he'd embarked on. But so I think, I think that's probably, if you ask me how is he going to be remembered if we sort of step forward or imagine ourselves 20 or 30 years from now, I think the vision will be, or the reputation will be a much more nuanced one than, say, the, the hitchens hirsch views sure. that dominated. Right. But it's never, it's never, I can't imagine a, a time when H Henry Kissinger will be seen as a national hero. I agree with that. But isn't it possible that you're, with your two volumes, and with a lot of the Vietnam era folks having passed through the system and retiring, that there's going to be a new crop of people who come along, historians who come along, who will not be as uh, heavily influenced by the Vietnam, by the 60s and 70s, didn't live through it. Well, yeah. To my students today, it's as distant as the Napoleonic Wars. It is. Uh, and so there is a process of becoming history that this book is a part of. Th this is becoming history. And, and gradually, the incredibly deep fissures of American society, the generation gap of the early 70s, is, is being displaced by something else. As it becomes history, then I think a less emotive language can be used. And one of the things that needs to be done, I think, in volume two is we need to establish some meaningful standard for judging foreign policy right. that is consistently applied to all administrations. Yeah, I was surprised that uh, you called him, uh, he was, he, you, you would describe him in the book as in his pre-government days as being the greatest theorist, and yet you called him a tactician in office, and I wondered whether he didn't bring a strategic sense. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, yeah. No, I mean, I think what's impressive is that by the time uh, he goes into the White House uh, in the, at the beginning of 1969 to take on the job that Nixon's given him, Kissinger has an extremely sophisticated strategic framework in right. mind, right. and he and Nixon uh, elaborate on it together. Nixon as president is the dominant player, certainly for the first two years. And considering the mess that they had inherited, and, and one cannot overstate what a total mess the situation was, not only in Vietnam, but around the world, I think they had a remarkably effective strategy. It could never be wholly successful because Vietnam could never really be salvaged. Right. But what's interesting is that once he's in government, he develops skills, political uh, and diplomatic skills, that he hadn't previously really evinced. This Kissinger uh, is in some ways um, a Kissinger who makes mistakes, who blunders, who's not a particularly skilled infighter in Washington, who's not a very uh, crafty diplomat. That Kissinger definitely comes later, and undoubtedly he learns good and bad things from Richard Nixon. Yeah. This, we have a question here about, do you see a young Kissinger today? I assume somewhat of a strategic sense. I certainly wish I saw one in Washington. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't see many thinkers of my generation who bring to foreign policy that combination of historical sensibility and, and philosophical sophistication. And I think this is a reflection on the way we as academics have have somewhat diluted uh, the product. I mean, what is studied as international relations in many departments, I won't 
suggest it happens at Harvard, perish the thought, <laughs> uh, often seems divorced from history. Whereas Kissinger's great uh, starting point is that history is to states what character is to individual people. And one cannot really do international relations without a deep historical understanding of the counterparties. Now, you will look in vain for significant history components in the major courses that one sees taught at schools of public policy. It's minor uh, and, and, and elective. So I think we've not really set about training the next Henry Kissinger. We teach a lot of of wonderful political science, but not enough history to the people who then end up in decision-making. Yeah, I, I must say, I despair. If you look at the two parties and you realize that there, our success in Cold, the Cold War was basically because we had a strategy that came out after the war uh, in the Truman days, and it was embraced by both parties, and there was sort of a stability across, and now we have no, there's no major strategist, neither party that I can identify who, who can form the base. Do we have any sense of what we're, where we're going in the Middle East? I mean, in Syria, there's, right. no, there's no strategy. I think there's a chronic absence of strategy, or if there is a strategy, it's a very bad one. And I wrote a piece to this effect the other day mm -hmm. in the Wall Street Journal. But one could equally well have said this of the, uh, of the Bush administration, which uh, had a strategy, but, but the strategy was terribly flawed and historically based on a kind of fairy tale version of the Middle East. So I, I, I think we've got to recognize that there's been a, a prolonged period, really since Bush Sr. Uh, left the presidency, of, uh, of a very weak strategic thinking in the United States, occasionally corrected when, when serious figures like Richard Holbrook trod the stage. I mean, mm -hmm. think of how the Bosnian disaster right. was brought to an end. I mean, that was quality uh, diplomacy and quality strategy we saw there. But um, if you think back to what's happened in, in the period since 9-11, uh, it's, it's been woeful. And I've been critical of both the Bush Jr. administration and the Obama administration, partly because presidents who knew they did not know much did not seek to get the expertise they needed. When Barack Obama said in an interview with David Remnick of The New Yorker, in January 2014, I don't really need George Kennan right now. Kennan, the architect of containment, a man who deeply understood Russia, which is why he was such a good architect of containment. I must say, I despaired. And it was only a few weeks later that Putin annexed Crimea, uh, making uh, a mockery, really, of that statement. So I think we've, we've, we've not only failed to train the next uh, statesman, the next grand master of strategy, even if that person existed, I'm not sure that recent presidents would have hired him or her. That's interesting, striking. Um, you've just provided the bridge. What do you make of Kissinger's friendship with Putin? I think friendship would be putting it too strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly have met frequently. I can't tell you how many times because I haven't sat down and counted it, and that will be, again, matter for volume two. I think what is striking about the relationship is, A, that Putin, like uh, other world leaders, Xi Jinping is another, has a great respect for Kissinger and seeks his counsel actively. They have both uh, done that. Um, B, Kissinger has a, a view of them which is shaped by that historical uh, approach that he's always taken, and you see that in the recent books, notably the World Order book. Uh, so what we have is an interesting phenomenon that is quite hard to make sense of. We have a man who, who left office in 1977 who has consistently been in communication with the leaders of the great powers of the world, including particularly Russia, uh, and China, but not only those countries, um, who's played a kind of uh, semi-official role in some occasions, but at other times has, has been in touch with these leaders, apparently without the White House showing much interest. Uh, so this will be a very interesting part of volume two to write, because it's really the kind of statesman without a state. Yeah, it's, it, and by the way, I, it, it was just the opposite for uh, Bill Clinton. He wanted to. He he told me that uh, the most the best advice he got on the Soviet Union came from Henry Kissinger. It's interesting that almost every president, I think, every president after Eisenhower, 
sought Kissinger's counsel. Not perhaps at first, but usually when things started to go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and this president's an exception to that rule. That the number of meetings has been, you could count on the fingers of one hand, and the content of those meetings, according to my understanding, has not been very profound. Mm -hmm. uh, we could go on on that issue, but perhaps we ought to uh, go stick with the questions. Uh, what do you believe, uh, I ask someone, Dr. Kissinger's policy would be in Syria today. How would it differ from President Obama's? Well, you could ask Henry Kissinger that and, and cut out the middleman, of course. <laughs> uh, because, and I don't want to find myself in the position of, of sort of channeling, uh, of channeling Kissinger. Uh, he, as you know, wrote an extremely critical uh, uh, piece on the subject of the Iran deal. He has written regularly on uh, the Middle East over the uh, recent years, and you can track the evolution of his thought through those op-eds rather than asking me. I think one thing is very clear. Uh, in his time in office, Kissinger made a point of ensuring that the Soviet Union did not have a pivotal role, a power-broking role in the Middle East, and that the Soviet relationship with Syria was not allowed to become a factor in the Middle Eastern peace process for us in this era to have allowed Putin uh, to take the initiative as he has, I think would certainly not be compatible with the Kissinger of the early 1970s. Well, Kissinger basically squeezed the Russians out. He, he did. forced them out in the 70s. It was one of the great achievements of the early 70s that the Middle East ceased to be a place where the Soviets had any influence. Mm. Broadly speaking, uh, the United States became the peace broker, became the pivotal power. And I think what's happened in this presence, in here I'm speaking as me, not as Kissinger, has been that by announcing, as the president did over the red line crisis, we are not the global policeman. I mean, he said that twice in the 2013 Address to the Nation. He has essentially created opportunity for President Putin to undo the achievement of the 1970s and to insert himself uh, as a potential power broker. This is not to say that Putin's uh, strategy will succeed. He has a very weak hand in a great many respects. But there's clear, there's no question the initiative is with him. And when he says, as he did at the UN General Assembly in this city just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you, you can't credibly argue for another leader in the region to be overthrown after what you achieved in other countries, it, it starts to sound like a pretty convincing argument. And I'm not somebody who's ever defended President Putin. I've likened him to Michael Corleone in the past. Uh, but at this point, Michael Corleone is having the better of the strategic argument. He has the, he has the low cards, but he's playing them better. Oh, yes. I mean, his position's really weak, and, and we tend to forget that in the West. We tend to forget that the Russian economy is in, in, in real difficulty, uh, not least because of the crash in energy prices, but also because of the pressure of the post-Ukraine sanctions. Uh, we forget that Ukraine hasn't gone that well for him, that in fact he lost Ukraine and has only been able to grab back bits of it. Uh, and yet, from this very weak position, uh, Putin has been able to put himself uh, in a situation in which, if he gets it right, we are quickly going to be faced with a choice between Assad or ISIS. Or, 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 or ISIS. Islamic State. And because, because we've essentially refused to be part of a Russian initiative, the Russians are now able to use their uh, military capability to help Assad defeat all the non-ISIS opponents of mm -hmm. the Syrian regime. And at some point, our policy of saying we want to defeat ISIS and get rid of Assad is just going to look incredible. Uh, and I think that's unfortunately a great strategic mistake. Uh, my view is, and again, it's my view, uh, not Kissinger's, that we are only just beginning to see uh, the magnitude of the disaster in the Middle East. If you look at the escalation of violence that's happened since the so-called Arab Spring, you know, we see these massive increases in, in conflict casualties and in terrorism in a really large swathe of territory across the Middle East and North Africa. I'm afraid you realize that things are going very wrong and have a lot further to go in that direction before they get better. So I'm uneasy. I think the next president's going to inherit a bigger mess than we, than we yet fully realize. It's a little bit more obvious to Europeans who are dealing now with millions of, of people pouring out of the region. Uh, here, I think we're still somewhat in denial about the scale of the disaster. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the result of strategic failure. Mm 
of a failure to understand the strategic problem that was presented the moment revolutions broke out uh, in Tunisia and Egypt and, and elsewhere. Yeah, there has been some talk that once the Iranian Accord was approved that people like Kissinger, David Petraeus and others would begin developing strategy and pushing for that, that that was, that would, absent that strategy we would drift. Well, Petraeus tried and, and set out a, a, a case which, for me, r recalled the intervention in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, Kissinger, I don't think, has explicitly right. uh, made a statement on this subject, uh, has in fact been relatively silent since uh, his critique of the Iran deal with George Shultz. Uh, but there's no question that he thinks uh, about it, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if he published something. You see, the problem about writing the, the history of a man who may live to be 110. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not immediately obvious when you'll be finished. Yes, you may have if ever. I am three. Now my, my sense is that he'll probably be giving the memorial address at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> we have one last question. Uh, tell us about your wife. Mm. I'm always happy to talk about her because she's much more interesting than me, maybe even more interesting than Henry Kissinger. Uh, she has spoken uh, here uh, before uh, and it's a very bad idea for me to, to speak after her in any venue because how can I possibly compete with Ayan's charisma and, and courage? She has just done another courageous thing, which uh, has been to fly back to uh, the Netherlands uh, to give a lecture at her alma mater, the University of Leiden, uh, where she studied. Uh, it's interesting to compare these lives. She. Uh, is another refugee, um, although her reason for arriving in the Netherlands is a bit different from Kissinger's reason for arriving in New York City in 1938. Uh, but they have, certain, they have certain things in common that I'm very struck by, uh, aside from the, 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 the courage that they both have certainly evinced in their lives. Uh, there is, to revert to my subtitle, a, a, an idealism there, but there's also the lightning rod effect. Um, Ayan's uh, probably even more reviled by Islamists than Henry Kissinger has been reviled by Chris Hitchens and a legion of, of his readers. Uh, and, and it seems to me that there's a certain parallel there. Uh, one of the hardest things uh, today is to speak frankly, uh, honestly about the threat that is posed uh, by Islamic extremism. It's become so hard that we're not even allowed to use that phrase. We have to talk about violent extremism and, and insist that Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, my wife has spent more than a decade uh, trying to explain to the world that that's a foolish thing to say and that political Islam poses a threat comparable in its, uh, in its magnitude to the threat that was once posed uh, by Soviet communism. Uh, it's just that our policy is, is radically different from the policies of the Cold War. As I was writing this book, and maybe this is an appropriate note on which to end, I kept being struck by the strange dissonances. In the Cold War, Americans understood uh, that communism posed a threat to individual liberty, that it was a violent ideology, that it was capable of, of great bloodshed and that it was also an enemy within that one had to be very vigilant about. Sometimes that vigilance ran out of all control, as in the McCarthy era, but there was something to be vigilant about. In our time, we, we do face a comparable threat in, in political Islam or Islamism, but we find it almost impossible to deal with it the way we dealt with communism, and that is partly because uh, we don't know how to deal with something that looks like a religion, even though it's also a political ideology. But it's also, I think, because we've lost some of the confidence that we had in the 1950s uh, about the superiority of our civilization and of our democracy. Uh, and in that sense, uh, being married to Ayana is a great source of inspiration to me, and uh, I'm very fortunate indeed to be in that situation. Neil Ferguson, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you.